Brothers and sisters, revolution is at hand, and we all have a part to play. And so we meet tonight in the Assassin's Den. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Assassin's Den podcast. I'm your host, Loomer, as always, and joining me today is Gabe Graziani, the senior community developer on the Assassin's Creed franchise at Ubisoft. Hello, Gabe. Hello. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, Esco Blades has the episode off, and joining us today is the lead writer of the Dead Kings DLC for Assassin's Creed Unity, uh, Jeffrey O'Hala. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi. Thanks for joining again. Uh, fun fact, Jeffrey was the first guest uh, ever had on this podcast back when the podcast had a different name where we talked about the Lost Archive, and that was like three years ago or something. So it's really cool to have you back as our first returning guest. <laughs> yeah, it's my pleasure. That was a great talk. Yeah, that was there was some really cool stuff in that podcast. You guys should check it out if you haven't heard it already. Um, so just before we get started here, I want to make a note that obviously we'll be discussing full spoilers for both Unity and the Dead Kings DLC. And uh, just so I don't do this at the end, I want to promote real quick that they're, in the last month or so, um, there have been two really cool new podcasts come out from the AC community. Um, one is from the forum community. It's just called the Assassin's Creed Community Podcast, I believe. And then uh, there's the Animus Island podcast um, that has come from the Assassin's Creed subreddit. I've been listening to both of them this last week, and they're both really awesome. So definitely check it out. We'll um, put some links in the video description. Um, you can also search for them on YouTube. So, Jeffrey, you have a very uh, long history with the franchise. Um, for people who don't know, you wrote um, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, uh, the Lost Archive DLC, the Da Vinci Disappearance DLC, like pretty much all the multiplayer storyline through AC3, uh, as well as Dead Kings now. And before that, you also did the, the glyph puzzles for AC2 as well. Uh, and yeah, and part of the script. Yes, and part of the script too. Um, so uh, I was really curious um, to hear how the idea of Dead Kings came about because, um, you know, this is a new studio, Ubisoft Montpelier, um, and they've done, you know, like Rayman and Beyond Good and Evil. They have a really rich history. It's their first time tackling the franchise, um, and we haven't really had a story DLC that was kind of like a direct follow-up to the main game, I think, since the Da Vinci Disappearance. And so I was really curious um, how this all came about uh, as a concept for the DLC. Well, um, at Ubisoft, you know, we have uh, many studios that are interested in tackling different pieces of major franchises, and um, it, a lot of times it comes from, you know, a place of passion that the studio feels like they're ready to participate in something like AC. And so, um, in this case, Montpellier approached us in Montreal, and, and um, we you know, needed a DLC for Unity, and Unity was in production, and so, you know, the team is entirely uh, tapped out making the game. And mm -hmm. so Montpellier wanted to make the DLC. And so we got to start um, in advance, more advanced than usual. You yeah. know, uh, when we did the Da Vinci Disappearance from Brotherhood, that was done with the same team right after we finished. Mm -hmm. So... You know, we had we had done Brotherhood in you know a very uh, rapid amount of time, uh, which was a complex, amazing job. I'm yeah. Still uh, <laughs> floored by the work that the team did on that game, and you know it was it was a powerhouse making it. And then we immediately jumped on to the Da Vinci Disappearance and made that. So in this case, we got to do it in parallel. Well, one of the things that I really like about um, the things that you write for the series, and I know a lot of the really hardcore fans really like too, is um, the way you you really tap into like the kind of the mysteries and kind of teasing people with um, puzzles. I mean, you know, the glyphs are always an oft-requested um, feature whenever <laughs> there's a new AC title coming out. They're like, bring back the glyphs. And I think, you know, uh, you can see that in the Lost Archive as well, I think, with a lot of things kind of hidden away. So I... Uh, that kind of ties into our uh, top-rated question here from Marcuse in Italy, who asks, um, considering your style in the previous AC releases that you have written, are there any hidden secrets that the community might have missed about Dead Kings to this day? Um, it, it taps into, uh, you know, a lot of the lore of the series, and, uh, you know, there are some key secrets that I think people have pointed out or, or discussed 
Um, there's definitely a very complex timeline maneuver that you can chart out um, from the movement of the piece of Eden in the game, and it will fit with the timeline of the work that I did in the glyphs. Um, but, I mean, there's always, there's always secrets in good writing. So I would say that um, I think it's more subtle in, in Dead yeah. Kings. Uh, because, you know, it's a, it's a studio that was almost, you know, halfway across the world. So, um, it's different than being there in person, uh, making the thing, which is what, you know, I did with the puzzles. So I was actually kind of curious, um, just real quick, uh, because yeah, ever since Revelations AC3, AC4, whenever I've done interviews at E3 and stuff, a lot of people have... Um, submitted questions asking about the glyphs coming back. And so I was really surprised um, in Unity to, see, Unity to see that they actually were coming back <laughs> um, in a different form. And so I was kind of curious, as the writer of the original glyphs, of what you thought of uh, their implementation in Unity. I mean, it's very different because in uh, Brotherhood, I uh, designed the puzzles from scratch. Mm -hmm. And it was, I had a small team working for me. And so uh, all of the images, all of the designs of the puzzles, all of the timeline base and all the writing, all of it came out of my work. Yeah. And so um, it was very unified. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, when you have a team, you know, making something uh, that isn't um, from, from one source and especially... Uh, being able to create the backstory of the entire brand was pretty exciting. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, you know, looking looking back on the the AC two glyph puzzles, it's just, uh, you know, it's an astounding thing um, where all of that work went in the, you know, in kind of the branching of the franchise to today. So. Um, I think with Unity, you know, you couldn't have that kind of ambitious creation. Yeah, I, I was a little disappointed when I found out what the glyphs actually were. And it was they just ended up being kind of like riddles uh, locations. And I, I almost kind of wondered if somebody like, you know, on the team had been like, OK, fans want the glyphs, check. Like, you know, kind of missing the <laughs> like the fact that I think what a lot of people really loved about the glyphs was kind of just... I mean, one, just like even like the atmosphere, you know, it's, you know, some of the puzzles were really creepy and like you felt like you were really unlocking stuff and like the Joan of Arc burning, yeah. really, like got in your head, like stuff like that. Um, and the way it brought in the franchise um, and obviously none of that happens with the Unity puzzles, but obviously I think it's also harder to do now because you want to be careful. You don't um, lay down more things that... Um, you know, like in the the tyranny of King Washington, like the developer said, like, oh, you know, the the glyph puzzles said Washington came in contact with the piece of Eden, so we felt like we needed to address that. You know, well, that's why it's fascinating. It's fascinating for me, you know, because uh, these were all things that I charted out. Um, you know, working at my little desk on yeah. AC two in a corner uh, on this big <laughs> production floor and. Um, you know, it's humbling to see all of them becoming games in their own right. Yeah. You yeah. Know, I think when, when this backstory was all charted out, you know, it wasn't clear that it was later going to turn into these incredible transmedia works. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's kind of interesting though. Cause like, I mean, one of the great things about the glyphs in AC2 and then also in Brotherhood, I think, was that they were, there's two different sides to them, right? Like, mm -hmm. there's both finding the glyph in the world and then there's a, a puzzle to solve within the glyph. And then there's like a, a sort of like a backstory reward that you get. I think one of my favorite ones, like Boomer, you're saying that they're kind of creepy, right? Like, one of my favorite ones is definitely the one where the guy calls the cable company because there's something wrong with his cable. It's like some rant, he's seeing some weird channel or something. And then they come to his house, like, within, like, five minutes, like, in the span of the time that he picked up the phone. And so, like, when we get, like, these other sort of glyph attempts, almost, like the, the Nostradamus enigmas in ACU, it feels like it's half 
half of what yeah what it should be right because you just go to the world and you find the glyph and then you solve and you solve the riddle to find where the location is but it's not giving you that extra like that extra chunk of like this like rich abstergo lore and like those who came before and all that stuff like the discussion is like very very limited to um what's happening in that world yeah. like at that time I feel I mean, like I, that speaks. I feel like that speaks a little bit. Sorry, I don't want to. Talk, but I feel like that speaks to your collaboration with, um, with the game design team too, right? Like, well, I have an incredible amount of freedom to make those, um, mm-hmm. and I, you know, like I'm laughing when you talk about the cable one because, you know, being in the voice recording studio with the, you know, the actress who had this wonderful, almost like southern accent. <laughs> for that the cable company rep who's super friendly and the contrast (laughs) between that and the agent who shows up but you know i was there making sure that she was even nicer Mm. than the first delivery of the line because then it would make that punch work even better and so it really was this period of complete freedom to make something that came entirely from a vision that i had Mm. and so i think that that is a huge privilege. And, you know, at the time, I just thought, oh, this is the way things should work because I come from a theater background. Mm-hmm. And um, so what you're talking about, about the mood of the puzzles and the atmosphere and the plot forwarding and the conflict in like a, in, in the fact that each piece of information is a reward because there's some kind of connection to uh, forwarding the plot and that kind of thing was all stuff that I took as a Mm. given and I wrote them like I would write a play. And so, and then the puzzles, the the navigation of the puzzles was like, you know, an immersive theater piece. And so it was, you know, what is the app? Each puzzle had a different atmosphere. And I actually worked with the um, UI artistic director, Laura DeYoung, who's just Mm incredible with this stuff. And she also thinks about that the same way. So it's like, what is the theme? You know, what is this puzzle? What are, what are, what's the mood we're trying to convey and then how can we use graphics to convey it? And so we went through all of them and honed, you know, this progression. And that was very important to me that, you know, like in theater, if you have a scene that exists for no reason, it shouldn't be in the play. And so every single piece of the puzzles was there for a reason. Um, and because I got to map out what all of the reasons were, it meant that nothing was duplicated or unnecessary or um, left out. And so that kind of oversight is invaluable and really doesn't happen very often in AAA. I think Mm -hmm. indie devs get to do that all the time, and that's the allure of making an indie game where you can actually control that direction whereas when you have a huge project it's much more of an amalgam of what everyone else is thinking Mm -hmm. and so you know there's probably like i said looking back on it now nearly like seven years later or six years later um i see what an extraordinary gift that you know that that was and on some level it was both uh from the core creative team And also accidental because it's such a big production and um, we were making things independently where you had the puzzles, you had the database, you had the, the assassin tombs and all of these things were designed by small groups so that they could be left out of the game if they didn't work out, you know, so they were completely independent entities that were going to be plugged in or not plugged in depending on whether they were good. Hmm. And so you know, because of that, there was no risk or very little risk to letting me just go crazy and go create this stuff. That's, I mean, that's intriguing because that's like, I mean, you almost got to curate your own sort of like artisanal handmade. Because I mean, I'm I'm remembering Laura and like she's she like mood boards were a big deal to her, right? Like everything yes. had a mood. Um, so it's like the the amount of attention. I feel like there's a really great difference in terms of like the amount of attention paid like to something that may or may not have made it into the game was like it's it's really intense to see that how well it worked out right well i we we thought that we didn't know that the thing may or may not have made it into the game that was something that was told afterwards 
Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because, you know, it's like productions to minimize risk. It's like worse, you know, of course, it's this stuff happens behind closed doors, but it's like worst case. Uh, I mean, they didn't want to remove any of it, but it was right. like worst case if this is a disaster because these are teams who have never done anything like this before. So yeah. if this is a disaster, then it won't be in the game. Um, but, I mean, in terms of working with Lara, she saw, you know, she, like you said, loves this kind of thing. And so when I came to her with... Um, this, you know, a map of what the puzzles would be mood wise and then ideas about how they would move and, and, and then the images from Wikimedia Commons, cause that was another huge gift. <laughs> yeah. It was right at the moment that <laughs> Wikimedia Commons came out. So this, this new thing comes out and it hasn't really been taken advantage of yet. Yeah. This archive of free photos that, you know, that, that are high definition. And so I was pulling all of this stuff from the archive. I became an expert in copyright law about what could be taken for free and what couldn't. And so I came to Laura with all of these assets and the moods and the ideas, and she was so excited you know, to work on this with me because uh, the main production doesn't function the same way. To more of the, the content of uh, Dead Kings itself. I think, uh, the first question that we have uh, comes from the, uh, the ones who came before, who are based in England, um, and they want to know, what is the name of the piece of Eden found by Arno? Um, well, I mean, I again, when I talk about this stuff, there are some secrets that I am keeping, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's no fun to, to give away the game. Yeah, definitely. But, sure. um, you know, the, the piece of Eden in the game is uh, one of the apples. Oh, so it's like a fun size apple of Eden, then, kind of, <laughs> right? <laughs> Cause it yeah, well, I mean, I mean, I know that there's been much discussion about the fact that it was smaller than the, others, the other pieces. Okay. Um, some of them are made, you know, different sizes, and that's how it is, but the function is an, an apple. It does very much look like an apple, but I also remember, uh, I think it was like a screenshot um, that someone took on the, of someone who asked you a question on Twitter about it, and you said that it wasn't an uh, apple of Eden. Was that just like misdirection? I think I just didn't want to answer that question. <laughs> and I think, I think ultimately I took that off because I think I shot back with that right off the bat, and then I decided that that was misdirection, so I deleted it. But to me, it doesn't really like, I mean, it's very important. I, maybe I'm giving away stuff again, but like the <laughs> apple goes to Egypt and then Napoleon goes to Egypt and that's when Napoleon's rise occurs. So yeah, it's just, it's just like more like it doesn't even really matter what it's called necessarily. It's just like a powerful first civ artifact. Is well, and it's the one that Napoleon has. Right. If you look mm, through the, the glyph puzzle timeline. Yep. Yeah. I remember yeah. that, yep. Okay. Why has he got his hand in his shirt all the time? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. <laughs> <It's> so perfect. <laughs> so this, this, this explains, you know, basically the journey is, you know, Napoleon uh, in the Tuileries Palace discovers the key that he's searching for in Dead Kings uh, to the vault and then goes in and almost gets a piece of Eden and then uh, Arno takes it and sends it to Egypt and then Napoleon goes to Egypt and gets it. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, this this whole block of questioning is basically about um, we kind of group them together as the mysteries of dead kings. So obviously, as much as you can answer. Um, but our next question is uh, um, from Led Betterman in Atlanta, who asks: um, Considering Arno had no prior exposure to any piece of Eden besides the sword, which he had no context for, um, how did he know to work it? Can we assume he has a large percentage of precursor DNA since he was able to use the lantern? I mean, Arno is part of a connected brotherhood in Paris. So unlike, say, an assassin like Ezio, who only received some lore from Mario, though Mario did a good job teaching him. So I would say uh, Arno knows about this stuff from the brotherhood. Um, next question is uh, Ye from Jaeger Bradley in San Francisco, who asks, um, who is this new Al Mualim? Um, al Mualim actually is a term meaning the master. Oh. And so it's not a person, even though in AC1, you know, al Mualim is referred to repeatedly. It's, 
it means the master. So or the mentor, I guess, right? Yes, it's kind of of the Egyptian mm. Brotherhood, or more or less master or mentor. So it's it, basically the leader of an assassin uh, cell is called a mentor. Yeah, I, I think most of the people like you know when I heard it right away, I was like, "Oh my God, Al Mualim!" And then I was like, I looked up and I was like, "Oh right, it's just the title." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I think most of the people on the forums and like subreddits and stuff figured that out too. But yeah, <laughs> there is that, that moment of brief what? shock moment. That was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that would that would be really uh, really strange. Yeah, it's like oh, the Shroud of Eden, like what came yeah. around and like brought him back from the dead and it's like oh no it's just the name of the mentor it's fine <laughs> oh, he's back he's better than ever yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay. um okay we have uh, another question from the cliffhangers in utah who asked uh if egypt were to appear in a future game which setting would be more appealing to you ancient egypt the napoleonic invasion or another period well i mean the napoleonic one would be a lot of fun uh but Ancient Egypt is probably more exciting, right? Mm -hmm. And we also have, you know, the story that, again, like, this backstory in, from the Assassin Tombs in AC2, but, you know, the oh, right. Cleo Cleopatra. Yep, yep. Um, so, okay. yeah, yeah, we have another one from uh, Marco from Italy uh, who asks, uh, was the Lady Eve mentioned in addition to the AC lore that might be explored in the future, or was it more of an Easter egg or reference to the original Eve? I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> um, but I, that is an example of obviously one of the, one of the secrets mm. that yeah, are hidden in there. This is one of those things where it's just like how it was brought up in Liberation about Eve, and that seems like it's a reference to the original, but it's like, why would you put that in there as a thing if you're not going to talk about it in the future? So this... I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that your answer is that it's like kind of like a secret because that kind of implies it'll be explored more, <laughs> I think. Yep. Cool. Anyway. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, so we have a question here from, I've, and I've, we've had this person submit questions before, and I think I just called them Gregors because I just have trouble with the name. <laughs> um, but they're wondering, how much input into the storyline of Dead Kings did the original Unity writers have? Uh, I mean, I ran stuff by Travis so that he knew what was going on. But um, not really that much. I mean, I, this is a little known fact, but I'm in the credits of Unity because I came up with uh, the original story structure. For And then I, I jumped off. Yes. Oh, I thought um, Alex Mancio has said that he kind of made the basic story. Is that not quite right? Or... No. Interesting. Um. This was done before he was on the team uh -huh. with a room. It was me and Sylvain Bernard and Gaelic Samard and um, some other people. Oh, crazy! So um, that's yeah, because it would have been it would have been right after Brotherhood, right? Like that's exactly. When, yeah, and then yeah, and okay. I know Alex was busy with Revelations. And then he left Ubisoft and then came back like fairly. Yeah, so I thought that was kind of weird, but I, I always and I assumed your name was in the credits for Dead Kings and. Uh, that's really no, no, no. My name is in the credits because I worked on the original story. Oh, interesting. Um, and then, of course, Alex added his own flavor, as all creative di directors should do when he showed up. Yep. So, basically, this I was very familiar with where the whole thing was going to go. And, in fact, Napoleon and the Peace of Eden had been discussed since the beginning. The only thing that I did was to make certain that the object inside the Tuileries Palace was not seen when Napoleon grabs it. So uh, that's really interesting. I, I'm So not a whole lot of input from the main writers of Unity, but I'm curious, um, uh, since you wrote the initial treatment for, or initial setup for Unity, if there was anything significant that was cut, like in the process that you could talk about that was really cool or... Um, I don't know any any differences, notable differences between the original um, outline and what ended up in the game. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a discussion about whether there was going to be a happy ending or an unhappy ending, <laughs> um, and that I think you know the ending went back and forth a lot. Um, and there's some other things too, of course, but I don't really want to talk about it because I think what was released is what was released, and that's that. But okay. <laughs> and I made you know it was a it was a moment where I went off and did Child of Light, 
and that's that. But um, yeah, I mean, I would say that you know the only thing that I would talk about because um, I think it's interesting is that that switching on the ending about whether whether it's a tragedy or not. And is that per- does that pretty much boil down to whether Elise lives or dies? Or yeah, well, but also Arno. Yeah, well, and how it affects him, I guess. Um, well, and and whether he lived or died. Oh, interesting. Okay. So there was some, you know, there was. Uh, it's always fun at the beginning to try to figure out what is the most daring thing you can do, and then figure out whether it will work or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's kind of an element about that. In the, hey, did you uh, work on the initial sequence that's not in par- uh, that's not in Revolutionary France? You know, the one with Jacques de, de Molay uh, in medieval times. That was. Um, did I work on it as in how? Oh, I mean, was that part of the initial outline? Uh, yes, but it was part of a much bigger... God, I wish I could talk about this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it, yes, but the way that it ended up distilled okay. in its current form definitely was uh, from Alex when he showed up. I see. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. I was just thinking because... I. I was surprised when the character that you play as in that sequence dies, um, you know, because he gets stabbed like at the very end. And I'm like, wait, you can't do that in the Animus because of, uh, you, know, you know, we've established that, you know, your perspective shifts once they pass their DNA onto their ancestors. And like, it's never really explained. But then, like, I think Darby kind of answered on Twitter a little bit about how, oh, well, if you can actually get the corpse and get the DNA from there, that's a source that has all the information up to death. But I, uh, I, I, that would have been really interesting to see that fit in, like if Arno had been killed off or something. <laughs> that that was one of the essential elements in the original pl- in the original plot, uh, and it was there since I was there at the beginning. And it had to do, oh God, there was a chain. I mean, what you're talking about, you know, kind of creates an investigation, right? Because it's like you're following something through time, mm. and so uh, you know, there's this film called The Red Violin. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> I don't want to go into what I don't sure. want to go into this because, again, this is something that, you know, the game came out the way it came out and that's how it was. But um, in the Red Violin, there's this this violin that's being followed through time and it's handed off from person to person to person. And that was something that really inspired me when I wrote the original story. Oh, that's awesome. All right. That's, that'll be some good homework for the AC community then. Go watch right? the movie. Like, <laughs> they should. It's, it's a fantastic movie. Um, but, yeah. you know, this idea that, that there's this object that's delivered to someone and then the person who delivers it, it dies. Yeah. Um, that was what really excited me about that. And then it stayed mm-hmm. in the, its current form, that kernel of it. That's like the perfect. This, is, this entire, like, last five minutes of discussion is the perfect gift for listeners of the podcast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like Jeremy's effortlessly like, all oh, here yeah. is another mystery for you to solve. Enjoy this one. Well, well in this Very case, much. it's not really a mystery. It's more like, oh, here's a fun bit of trivia on how things could have been like in an alternate, you know, reality where the story, you know, the stories can always, always change like during the process and, Right. Well, and that's why it's not, I mean, sometimes it's fun to talk about it, but often it just makes you sad because uh, the changes occur due to tech limitations or, you know, it's basically yeah. that when ideas hit the reality of production, you end up with something that's too expensive or that can't be made in the amount of time that remains. And so, yeah. you know, they're not abandoned because they're bad. Yeah. And so it that makes it doubly difficult because you end up with regret, you know, and, and anyone that you tell the idea to, or you tell the original treatment to, or you tell that stuff to ends up going, ah, but that would have been so awesome. And so <laughs> you, you know, it's not, but you gotta be careful. Cause you don't even know if, you know, even if they had implemented the original idea, like the execution and presentation matter a lot and you don't even know it would be, it's easy to be like, oh, that would have been like the best thing ever, but you don't, no, well, no, but right. there were several <laughs> treatments, as in, like, I was there when that, I when the original one changed. Oh, okay. So, so it went through about two or three versions and uh, kept a lot of the elements, but they moved around. Yeah. And then I left for Child of Light. 
Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's really interesting here, especially since I think the community is overall like I think this is probably the worst received story out of the main games. I would say, <laughs> unfortunately, so I guess it helps to hear about the process and kind of how it all goes together. Well, I mean, games are like operas, you know, where there are so many moving parts. Mm-hmm. You know, one if one thing in an opera, you know, the set, the orchestra. Um, every instrument in the orchestra, the singers, um, if the story, the the score, if one thing goes wrong, the whole thing ends up, you know, suffering. And so uh, when you make something this big and this complex, it's difficult to get everything right. And especially, like you said, you know, when uh, ideas shift and people leave, it gets it gets uh, fractured. Yeah. So, um, but at the same time, I think a lot of the reception, at least personally, um, came from the sort of pre-patch, uh, I won't say hoopla, but it was like, you know, <laughs> the press, the press has these talking points and, oh know, yeah. And they reused the faceless images on like every single post, even though it was like affected like two graphics cards and was fixed in a day one patch and stuff and yeah, kind of like drives the sentiment. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, and I had a lot of friends who, you know, they told me and they know that I had nothing to do with writing it. Mm-hmm. You know, the plot structure is different than writing the words. And Travis did an incredible job with the script in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And like, um, you know, he wrote this the love scene between Arno and Elise after the balloon chase is like one of my mm-hmm. favorite scenes in AC mm-hmm. um, on the page. And, you know, it's just really well written. And so friends would tell me knowing that, you know, not to be nice because they know I didn't write it. So it's not a compliment <laughs> to me. You know, they're not sucking up to right. me. <laughs> it's like, oh, I actually thought the story was really good. Um, I just think that it got overshadowed by all of the the press stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's and the the pre patch. You know that once the patch was implemented, and like now, if you play the game, I think it's a very different experience. Mm-hmm. So my personal feeling is, uh, maybe in the future it will be. You know, uh, it's not like a cult classic, but <laughs> you know, people will appreciate. Because, uh, you know, it, it's it's definitely a blockbuster and it did well. So Right, right. <laughs> but I think people will appreciate the story more. Okay. It's funny. It. I mean, I'm super biased, obviously. But, I mean, I, I, I we, we received, like, really similar feedback, I think, with Revelations um, in terms of, you know, and, and and with AC3 and all. And, like, there's, there's a certain period of time, I feel like, more recently since, since Revelations and then and then AC3, um, where the, there's so much expectation built up around the games themselves. Right. It's difficult to, like, it's, it's difficult to objectively evaluate any individual part of them, right? Um, but, of course, now we have people going back and talking about how much they loved Yusuf in Revelations and, you know, uh, the, the arc with Ezio, how it's a perfect, like, goodbye for him. Um, and it rounds yeah. things out really nicely. Like it shows him like getting older, and it it discusses that in a way that like is really kind of emotionally impactful. Yeah, and I've I've heard um, in um, the community podcast I mentioned earlier, um, in both of them, it, it's really surprising, at least to me, to hear um, so many of these hardcore fans like will um, talk about how Revelations is their favorite game, favorite story, Constantinople is their favorite setting, and everything. And you know, if you look at it, kind of common. Uh, consensus is that Revelations is one of the worst in the series, right? And, like, it's so, it's really, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if Unity ever has that kind of, uh, if how, how history treats it in a few years, you know, when fans look back on it, if it'll be the same or not. Yeah, I mean, I think that the scope and the, the, the feeling of Paris and what they were trying to do, you know, it's really, it's really something. That I, I think actually you're probably not going to want to answer. Uh, it's from Mystery Mystery, uh, Mr. E Mystery yeah. <laughs> from Sydney, Australia. 
who asks, what happens to Arno and Leon after Dead King? Does Arno become his foster father? Does he train Leon to become an assassin? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you, you, you'd have to see what we ended up doing with that. So obviously, you know, answering that question is silly at this point without actually, re- re- you know, releasing something, um, yeah. you know, in a story that we tell in the future, maybe uh, that will be told. But it's also important that for me, I guess this is a little like the glyph puzzles, but um, Leon functions on multiple levels. So there's the relationship between Arno and Leon, but there's also the fact that Arno is leaving Paris Mm -hmm. at the beginning of Dead Kings. And by the end, he decides to go back to Paris. So that journey of leaving is like a father leaving his son. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, because Arno helped free Paris and has responsibilities to Paris and decides to leave. And so Leon is an orphan um, who needs a father. And so Arno at one point is also leaving Leon. And then ultimately Leon's relationship with Arno convinces Arno to stay. And so the relationship, I would think, based on the metaphor I'm talking about right now, Mm -hmm. would deepen in the future, right? Yeah. Okay. I, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, kind of the inspiration for Leon and maybe working with the child actor, because I was really surprised to see that be a component of uh, Dead Kings. We haven't really had any significant child characters in the game, really, you know, outside of mm-hmm. things like, you know, Petruccio and like, you know, young, young Arno and Elise, like they're usually very minor parts. And even though Leon isn't like a huge character in, tr- in the franchise necessarily, he's probably the biggest child character i think that we've seen a little curious where the inspiration came from and your experience with that that was really uh, a gift um being able to create that character and and have it work out mm. um you know it's a tough line especially with uh gamers i think to some degree you know because there's a sense that i don't want to hang out with a kid yeah yeah <laughs> mm. um and that's a tough thing to overcome where you have people who are just going, you know, like Clint Eastwood and Gran Torino, get that kid off my lawn. <laughs> I, I, I found it interesting that, you know, Leon wasn't, he was a total surprise. Like he wasn't mentioned in any of the marketing materials or trailers or anything. Right. And I wonder if that was part of it, you know, because there's kind of like, you know, like a, a stigma kind of like where people are like, oh, I don't want to play a game where I have to. You know, we're you know, compan- AI companion stuff always already gets a bad rap. You know, if it's a kid, it's even more annoying potentially. Yeah, I mean, I think I wanted it to be a surprise because Leon has talked about you know as a, a fearsome criminal, <laughs> and so the fun of having that uh, turn out to not be the case. You know, that there was a, a surprise in that, and it, it's nice that right. it wasn't spoiled. You know, but. I also, you know, um, to me, again, because Arno was leaving France, there needed to be someone who brought him back. And so creating this this child, someone who needs protection, who is independent on his own, but and has the spirit that uh, Arno was now missing because of the experience he had with Elise. You know, I mean, the, the game is exciting for me because it's like a week after Elise died. Yeah. And so how does Arno deal with this? It's it's a horrifying situation and his reaction is to run away. And so the only thing for me that could bring him back is someone who who needs him and who teaches him about the spirit that made him an assassin in the first place that's gone now. And so um but again, that's a very difficult line to walk. And I have the added limitation that the whole thing had to be 15 pages long. Oh. Which is Whoa. an insane... <laughs> like, if you think about it, a 15-page script, you you know, d- this is the shortest of short stories. And I think it ultimately ended up being like 12. So it was 12 to 15 because they the 15 was ultimately even too long. So it wasn't like... There were scenes that are, that are gone, that I'm sad mm. are gone. Um and so it was a very tight story where it had to be uh, conveyed in the shortest possible way. So um, Eamon was a gift. He's the actor who played Leon. And 
this kid, um, you know, getting into mocap and the voice rehearsals, he just constantly blew me away. And, um, you know, that he would find ways to convey what Leon was feeling or, you know, there's this wonderful moment where Leon's sword fighting with a tree when Arno comes to apologize to him. And you can see that he's taking out his frustration, um, you know, on, on the tree and he conveys this emotion from lines that were cut, you know, we had to make the scene shorter. And so you can see what would have happened in the dialogue between them through his actions. And the actor proposed that as an alternative. So (laughs) this little kid, yeah, he was just, um, he was so professional and, uh, really constantly surprised me, you know, uh, having that as an artist is the most you never have that or it's very rare where someone uh, you're working with, you you suggest something. It's like, oh, could you do this? And then they come back with something that's better than what you suggested where you're like, whoa, you know what? My idea was stupid. Your idea is way better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the biggest pleasure. Yeah, it's it's such a pleasure to have someone take something you've done and make it better where it's like, yeah. you know, you're you're in awe of it and you you go, wow, this is even better than I dreamed. So you you wrote Dead Kings, I'm assuming, right after you finished Child of Light. And I'm wondering if, uh, you know, the kind of the childlike perspective, like, you you know, uh, seeing things from the perspective of a child influenced uh, bringing a character like Leon into the story at all? Or was that just kind of a coincidence that you did two stories like that? I think it was kind of a coincidence. Um, I thought that this was something originally... I mean, I could tell you, I think, where the idea came from. And it didn't have anything to do with Child of Light. It had to do with one of the original treatments for Unity. And one of the original treatments for Unity involved a little thief that was partnered with Arno. Oh. Um, You know, and that there would be this relationship between the little thief and Arno that would uh, develop over the course of the game. And this was an idea that uh, someone who was working on the project and then stopped working on the project had proposed that he liked this character. And so I had thought at the time, oh, this is interesting. We, didn't, you know, we don't have this in AC. You know? And I also thought immediately, oh, God, gamers are going to hate having a little kid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you know, so my reaction when it had been proposed originally was, oh, um, it, yes, but we got to figure out how to make this kid cool. Um, and, and also not, you know, in the way and, and all these other things so that we can win over the hearts of people who don't want a child in their game. Yeah. And, uh, so ultimately that didn't happen, but then this DLC opportunity occurred. And then for me, it was like, oh, this is great because we can actually try the kid in a context where don't, you know, it's a DLC. It's not the full game. Right. So. With a DLC, you have the opportunity to take some risks that you can't take in the main game because it's a shorter piece and, you know, people are more tolerant of it. And um, if if there's a risk, it's less. Right. So it's like, okay, well, I want to try this child. And again, because of the story, you know, this is a week after, Ar- uh, after Elise's death. So the story has to be about him getting over that. Right. And you know, him staying in Paris rather than leaving, which to me would be his reaction. You know, the love of his life has died. So of course he's going to go someplace else. He's going to retire. He's going to leave this. And how do you stop that? How do you uh, turn that back on itself? And um, that seemed like the best solution to me. Yeah. Um, before we move on to the next question, I'm a little curious. Where does the um, 15-page restriction come from on the script? That's production. It was the amount of budget that we had to oh, make wow. it. I mean, you know, the, this ended up being a free DLC, right? Uh, so it's like this is the amount of money that are, is allocated to making scenes. Interesting. Okay. All right. So um, our next question uh is from the cliffhangers from Utah again, and they ask, uh, what was your favorite part of Dead Kings? I always like, you know, the supernatural puzzle stuff, or the stuff where, you know, it turns out to be a first Civ tech behind something supernatural, so I like the, the idea of the ghosts. Yeah. Um, but I would say I, I, every scene with Leon, I mean, I love the scene 
where Leon gets the um, the the guillotine gun <laughs> and gives it to Arno. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> I just think that that's really well acted, um, and when I watch it, it really hits me as authentic and surprising, and um, I'm really happy with how that turned out. Uh, switching gears a little bit uh, for our next question from Tartgold in Alberta, Canada, who asks, uh, considering that you've made the truth glyphs and wrote the story of Subject 16, which was my favorite modern day plot, is there anything you can tell us about Subject 16 that AC fans might have missed? I mean, again, everything to be told of Subject 16 will, uh, will come out in another work or... Um, for me, telling it over, you know, the air like this is yeah. uh, is going to ruin your experience. So you just have to wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, and I have the next question as well um, from uh, Vestigia Lama Four in Mumbai, India, <laughs> who asks, "Why is uh, why is Napoleon?" I think it's funny that this, there were three, apparently three others. <laughs> Vestigia Lamas, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but they ask, uh, why is Napoleon much more of a bad guy in Dead Kings than in the main game where he and Arno seem to be friends? Well, the interesting thing about Napoleon is that uh, his speeches in the Dead Kings DLC are predominantly real speeches. Like, wow. when he's talking, it's literally word for word what Napoleon said. So, Napoleon's philosophy... Uh, change significantly from when he was younger to when he went on to become uh, the ruler of France. And there's this big shift where he was an idealistic, young, um, liberal, and then he switched to becoming this very um, suspicious, hardened, jaded uh, leader. You know, and everything he says about humanity is true. In you know, is true to what he believed, which is this idea that people are uh, easily manipulable, that they will do the the thing that is in their self interest first, that they're predictable because of that, and that you can use them. Yeah. Hmm. So um, that shift struck me as very appropriate for the DLC because Arno also has shifted from you know believing in the assassin cause and believing what he's doing and ha- wanting to save Paris to leaving. So. Uh, Napoleon is kind of a dark version of what Arno could become. Um, but I mean, truthfully, it's that Napoleon was that person. He's the person in the Dead Kings DLC. He's not, you know, and you briefly meet him in Unity, right? <laughs> so it's also, and it's in an action action moment. So. I, I, basically, it's that, you know, in this one moment, Arno is helping Napoleon, so Napoleon appreciates the help. And then in the Dead Kings DLC, Napoleon's, you know, on his way to becoming the emperor and is is found, he's found a shortcut to doing that. We also talked a little bit about this dynamic in our last podcast with Dan Janot, who played um, Arno Dorian. And he, right. he also brought up the that he was um, really good friends with the the actor who plays Napoleon, and some some of that probably came through also. But I think it's also at this point, um, Arno um, kind of sees that Napoleon is he knows that Napoleon is extremely intelligent, and um, it's a little worrying that he's trying to like amass more power, so he comes off as the bad guy a little more, especially when they're not directly interacting with each other. But I think it's also kind of interesting that later on, you know, however many years later, like 10, 15 years later, they come back to the tomb um, and pick up the skull of Germain, right, and put it in the catacombs. And it's, so they seem to be on good terms at that point. And so it's like, it feels like there's a lot of missing gaps, you know, of, of the story between those two. Yep. Just, <laughs> as I'm sure, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so on that note... Well, uh, N- Napoleon is a... Napoleon is really a fascinating character, and the arc of his journey, I'm, I would love to tell that, because uh, yeah. there is a, you know, Napoleon went through this big shift when he lost power, oh. too. So, 
of all the historical dictators, you really get a strong sense of different periods in Napoleon's life, you know, like Picasso and his blue period and then <laughs> Cubism. And, you know, the, the, and I think it's because we get closer to the present, so we know more. And he wrote so many books, so we also have all of his writings oh, right. um, and letters. And, you know, you have these these incredible love letters that I'm sad didn't end up in the game, you know, his letters to Josephine uh, mm. that are just really whiny and um <laughs> and very very uh heart sick mm. <laughs> so we have all these sides of napoleon that you don't have of someone like julius caesar yeah and so you know being able to take napoleon through all the different periods in his life would be very exciting all right so next question is from i hope i don't butcher his name it's ing Kleefman in the netherlands who asks um why did you come up with the idea to bring a fake Elise into the DLC? I literally dropped my controller when I found out she wasn't real. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's probably my other favorite moment in the DLC, just because, again, you know, Arno is haunted by Elise. And I would have put Elise in a lot, actually. You know, the, this, this woman that he's following that he thinks is Elise, and she keeps appearing to him, and then ultimately he says goodbye to her when he's in the darkness, in the, in the water at mm. the end. And so that journey where it's like he's chasing this Elise and trying to get her back and then ultimately Leon helps him get over it and realize that he needs to be there for his child, for Paris, rather than chasing this dead woman. And that's a, that's a heartbreaking moment because um, it's basically he has a duty and as a father he has a duty and that's what uh, Madame Margot, the owner of the orphanage, says to him. Right. And so ultimately, yeah, and that's like a missing scene, right? At the end, there was a scene between him and her I see. that's not there uh, with Leon in bed. He puts Leon to bed, and then there's a scene between the two of them. And, um, but you get that, I think, in the final version. It's just not spoken. But, but there's this sense of Arno agreeing to take care of his child rather than getting lost in the catacombs of following a ghost. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> it's funny to hear you talk about like gamers not having like a positive reaction to uh having a child in the game because it's it almost like so I have a child like I have a son and so to play the portions with Arno and Leon seems to me like very much it's like a part of my normal like emotional existence at this point right is to like have someone that I need to care about in my life and like you know that I just I do care about it. it means the world to me is more important than anything else. So whenever I see the, a depiction of that in games that is, you know, done competently, it's almost invisible to me whether or not, you know, I mean, the only times I can, I, I think about like them, like pushing the dad button. And it was like, uh, in that, I forget what the game uh, it was a huge game. Um, the last of us. The one with, no, <laughs> no, 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 that one. That one, at least at the beginning, I felt was a little bit ham-fisted. It was a little bit like, <laughs> pull, just like went right for the heartstrings. And it was like, all right, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, but, not like... I mean, I mean no, the, no, no, no. the good example is the, is, uh, the Walking Dead, right? Mm, that mm, somehow... Yeah. But that's very specific because they managed to make Clementine... They put Clementine into yeah. the middle of an incredibly dark situation yeah. mm -hmm. where she represents the only hope of you know a future like the road the, the yeah. i feel like when you have a child in that kind of situation in a game it's okay because the game is so dark yeah. that the child <laughs> is like oppressed by the darkness yeah. and so as a gamer you know as a tough jaded gamer you're like uh the world is such shit <laughs> and this child it, you know and this child's probably going to die. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to protect the child as long as I can, but you know, that child's going to live a terrible life if the child lives, <laughs> yeah. which is how life is anyway. And that's why children are so <laughs> annoying because they're happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but that's not everyone. And again, it's not, it's also not like, necessarily gamers. I feel like it's yeah. this more like kind of heavy metal type, you know, goth <laughs> approach, which 
And again, like, I don't have any problem with that. And in fact, I think it's totally legit. And I feel that way sometimes. And yeah. so it just means that when you have a child in your game, you have a split, which is between gamers like you who have a child or who are, don't have the perspective about life. And so then it's like, okay, well, this, this, having this is refreshing. Having a child is refreshing. And it allows me to explore other aspects of life. And then you have groups of people who want to embrace the darkness. And so having a child is directly antithetical to that. Well, I mean, it's certainly like being like a death dealing, you know, angel of complete lack of mercy and, you know, being like the idea of being an assassin. Your existence is not right around like caring for children. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> right, exactly. So it's a tough, like, I didn't want to walk into a trap where it's like, okay, here's a game about a dark assassin and you have a child. And so as you can see, the child is codenamed or, you know, the name Leon is a mirror of uh, the professional. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> which is a dark, yeah. Leon the professional is a dark film, with a child. you know, about about a hardened assassin who has to take care of a child oh my god i totally missed that (laughs) (laughs) and so Uh, to me that was a guiding principle it's like this needs to feel more like leon because uh, um if it doesn't you know if it's too soft like something like child of light then you end up with people being upset but i don't know if you can actually like I feel like a child is risky always for a game because I think you always end up with a group of people who want nothing to do with children, who who see that rightly as being, you know, maybe more enjoyable by fans of, let's say, a Disney film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, you know, a lot of people don't like, so. But there's also a lot of people who do like that and that's what the, that kind of a plot is for. So uh, we have another question here um, from M. Gupta, England, in Surrey. Uh, so things that you can't discuss aside. Oh, this is, <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything you would like to take from Dead Kings into future releases of AC? And would you tweak them at all to fit into another story? Um, I mean, there's always things that resonate with you as a writer that you come back to until you've solved why you, until you understand yourself. I mean, the process of writing is a lot like trying to figure out why we exist as human beings, why you exist, um, why you have this obsession with, um, you know, some, some like, uh, I don't even know. It's always things like Spielberg has this obsession with divorced couples <laughs> and, <laughs> whether the son or the daughter is going to get back together with the parent or whether they're going to end up on another planet or are dead. Mm. Um, you know, and that happens in Indy three with Sean Connery and Indiana Jones. It's like, are they going to patch it up and where's the mother? There's no mother. Same thing in ET. You have a mother who has no father, a new father comes in the picture and Elliot says, I'd rather go to another planet than have this new father. Oh, yeah. mm. And then it becomes, is he going to stay or is he going to go? Close Encounters, you have this kid, you know, with a single mother and the mother loses the child on the spaceship and is trying to get the kid back. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you do it with all of them. Even Munich, where it's like the mother is Israel and the prime minister is a woman and represents mother Israel. And it's always, so it's a single parent. And the question is whether the kid is going to get back with that parent or not. And so Spielberg is working through that question. It's War of the World is literally that, you know, mm. blatantly. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, and that's the happy ending version. Uh, and sometimes it's unhappy. So um, that issue is core to who he is. And so he keeps reworking it. So there will always be themes that I come back to. And sometimes I don't know that I'm coming back to them. And sometimes I do know that I'm coming back to them. And writing is an obsession and a compulsion, and it's probably really bad for you. (laughs) (laughs) But the audience gets to enjoy it, and that's all that matters. It's like you get to, you're recording a nervous breakdown in slow motion. 
That's where the that's where the best art always comes from, though. <laughs> from and then and then if if it, it you want it to end in a tragedy because then you're going to get a lot of really good writing. Like yeah. if you're the audience, that's what you want. You want the writer to self destruct little by little over time, producing many works. Because if the writer fixes themselves, yeah, then they I, stop writing. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's like you kind of you're kind of pulled from the audience. It's like in some works where it's like, oh, like is Trent Reznor really better? Is he happy now? I don't want him to be married. I kind of want him to just go back to his downward spiral <laughs> like <laughs> phase of <laughs> where things are really fucked up. <laughs> they made some awesome music, and then it's like, and then on the other hand, you're like, right, That's a person, mean, it <laughs> like, is. He should be healthy. <laughs> <laughs> like, the collective yeah. good is more important. <laughs> the collective yeah. good of being entertained. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what all of Darren Aronofsky's films are about for me. Mm. You know, that every single one of them, including like explicitly Black Swan and The Wrestler, are about what would you do to entertain people? What would you sacrifice to keep people entertained? So, so yes, I mean, I I guess the answer to the question would be, I'm sure I will revisit themes from Dead Kings because I can't help myself. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, we have another question. Um, This one is from uh, Gurgly uh, from a place called Zegan. Um, And the question is, is Arno rejoined? So is Arno, has Arno rejoined the Brotherhood at the end of the DLC? Because he has the original uh, Novus Assassin robes. Um, it's a visual metaphor. I I would say. I mean, the answer is yes, but that's the metaphor for it. Yeah. Yeah. I feel it feels kind of like one of the biggest, almost kind of like plot holes. I don't know if it's exactly a plot hole, but you know, when Arno returns at the end of Unity and he has his Master Assassin robes, and everybody's. I don't know, at least I was, and then I've seen a lot of other people express this sentiment, too. It's like, wait, when did that happen? Like, they're just going to just, uh, like, it feels like there was a scene yeah. that was cut because he was very clearly excommunicated in a weird way that didn't really affect him all that much. Like, they didn't take away any of his stuff or anything, I don't think. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> but then Well, he... that's, that's a problem that the DLC actually seeks to resolve. Uh, you know, that, the, uh, that Arno's arc in Unity... Um, after that moment that you're talking about, it remains fairly static. And so then there's that jump to the end. And so the question becomes, where is the, where does he, uh, gain the energy to do that? Yeah. And to me, the beginning, the spark of that is the Dead Kings DLC. Yeah. And you do hear Arno say like, you know, he kind of gets his resolve back and he's like, you know, I am an assassin. And yes. Even though that's not actually literally the point where he rejoins the Assassin Brotherhood, it's more like a frame of mind type thing, and you can see him eventually going back, being like, "Hey guys." Like well, no, right, there was know, a whatever. final shot that was supposed to be Paris in the background with him walking towards Paris. Oh, okay. Uh, so it would have been explicit, like, "I'm going to go do this." Yeah. Um, so we have one we're nearing the end of the questions here. Uh, we have a question from someone in the community who asked. Um, I was really surprised when Arno said Ezio's famous line. This is, of course, when Arno finds the body. He's like, well, requiescat in pace. And uh, he was like, is it only for fan service purposes or does Arno know about Ezio? Um, It's Latin. So to me, it's part of an assassin ritual that wasn't really a big part of um, the Brotherhood in Paris at that point. But he's heard it. Yeah. All right, so we're going to wrap up this uh, episode with just two questions that are kind of almost opposites of each other. The first is from uh, Sir Mick Sarcasm Italy, um, who asks, uh, how did you get involved with the Assassin's Creed franchise? If you could just summarize that real quick. Um, I came to Montreal in order to work with the director of Prince of Persia, Sands of Time, and the team that made that. Because for me, that was a game that really touched my heart. And so... I uh, applied immediately to work with the the group of people who made that, and there was a big interview process, and it was a very long three-quarter-of-a-year thing where um, it seemed like I wasn't going to be able to get the job, and then I went to E3 on a press pass writing for a local newspaper in Santa Fe and um, basically went and wrote a, a piece interviewing the producer of Sands of Time 
for this article in order to ask for the job and say, you know, I, I really think I can do this. And then, Mm -hmm. um, that was impressive enough that I got to have interviews with people like Clint Hawking and with other people. And, um, at that point, at that point, the team was all the Assassin's Creed. Sorry, Jeffrey. I think you're, we're having issues with your, um, audio. Are you there? Uh, I can hear you now. Yes. Okay, did you hear the end? I said as soon as that game was released, I went on to AC2 to work with them. Okay, as soon as AC1 was released. Yeah. Oh, okay, awesome, yes. Very cool. And so our final question um, is kind of the other end of that, which is, uh, this is from Shakulu101 in Scotland, who asks, uh, would you ever consider being the lead writer for a main title again, and what is your dream AC location? So a two-parter. Um, the answer to the first part of the question is, it may happen sooner than you think. It's a nice tease. <laughs> um, let's say that I've considered it and I am past considering it. All right, awesome to hear. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. I was really um, excited to see you come back to the franchise because you had been involved with everything from AC two up until AC three, and then AC four was like your first break, like completely. I think right. You know, you were doing stuff with the uh, you know child of the child of light team and. They were made into uh, like a permanent unit of like a team at, at Montreal. Is that correct? Like, um, you know, Patrick and that team. I, I remember seeing some article about that. Is that right? And are you a part of that team? Yes. Yeah, so that's that's kind of a conceptual idea, which is that there's a, a place in Ubisoft that's interested in doing more experimental, smaller yeah. stuff. Um, but that team rotates. OK. You know, so it's not the same people always. And there are some people who come in and some people who leave and um, it's less fixed than what that article. Implied. Uh, okay. Got it. Okay, cool. And then I interrupted the, the second half of the, uh, the question, which is uh, what is your dream AC location? Um, Victoria and London's a pretty good dream <laughs> location. All right. Yeah. That's a, that sounds like an awesome favorite location. I'm <laughs> Totally for that. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, um, so normally we'd uh, kind of finish and say kind of uh, if you're, there's any other projects you're working on in the future to look out for. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm very excited about what I'm doing next. It's already, you know, I'm very uh, deeply into it. I'm actually working on it right now. <laughs> today. Okay. Great. Yeah, I, I uh, <laughs> took a break to talk to you and I've got to work well into the night. Uh, tonight awesome um yeah but i'm very excited and things are coming together and you know knock on wood pretty nicely and um i'm excited to share everything with the world so uh wait and see um i hope everyone likes it obviously and you know um in the future after that you know just pushing uh the medium forward taking everyone into new and exciting places making uh even more I guess, personal experiences. Hmm. Uh, I'm very excited about the Oculus Rift and about virtual reality and about, you know, the Valve headset. The, I just yeah. cannot wait to live in a world. And I can't wait to play with um, the fact that you can see or play a main part of a game in VR, but you can also, like, look around and explore and not even participate in the game. Yeah. Hmm. So it it creates this incredible juxtaposition where you can have you can have a story that is about both what you're doing and what you're not doing. All right, great. Well, so thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us again. It was a real pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure as well. And uh, your questions are always spot on, and it's a you know it's great to be able to talk about some of this stuff to to do the tip of the iceberg at least yeah yeah <laughs> definitely for sure um so you can of course follow jeffrey on twitter uh at twitter.com slash jeffrey yohalem all one username smushed together um be sure to check out i believe this month uh the month of april child of light is on uh xbox games with gold for xbox yeah. one i believe so definitely check it out it's i love i have played through it i love it it's made by um, you know, a lot of AC alumni, including Jeffrey, who wrote it. And also check out Far Cry 3 that Jeffrey also wrote and that I also loved. If you haven't played it, if you haven't played Far Cry 3 and you're an Assassin's Creed fan, you should definitely check it out. It's probably really cheap. And in a lot of ways, like, I kind of feel, at least gameplay-wise, it's almost like Assassin's Creed 3.5. Like, you can see a lot of, um, uh, there's, you know, there's a few things that AC4 borrowed from uh, Far Cry 3 and Far Cry 3 borrowed from, like, Assassin's Creed. It's just really... 
It was a really cool game. <laughs> yeah, and then also, of course, be sure to check out the uh, podcasts, the two Assassin's Creed community podcasts I mentioned earlier in the episode. We'll have links in the video description. And we'll be back with more episodes of the Assassin's Den soon. So see you later. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you.